the President of the United States. Less than a month ago, this nation reminded the world that it possessed both the will and the weapons to meet any threat to the security of free men. The gains we have made will not be given up, and the course that we have pursued will not be abandoned. But in the long run, that security will not be determined by military or diplomatic moves alone. It will be affected by the decisions of finance ministers, as well as by the decisions of secretaries of state and secretaries of defense, by the deployment of fiscal and monetary weapons, as well as by military weapons, and above all, by the strength of this nation's economy, as well as by the strength of our defenses. You will recall that Chairman Khrushchev uh, has said that he believed that the hinge of world history would begin to move when the Soviet Union outproduced the United States. Therefore, the subject to which uh, we address ourselves tonight concerns not merely our own well-being, but also very vitally the defense of the free world. America's rise to world leadership in the century since the Civil War has reflected more than anything else our unprecedented economic growth. Interrupted during the decade of the 30s, the vigorous expansion of our economy was resumed in 1940 and continued for more than 15 years thereafter. It demonstrated for all to see the power of freedom and the efficiency of free institutions. The economic health of this nation has been and is now fundamentally sound. But a leading nation, a nation upon which all depend, not only in this country but around the world, cannot afford to be satisfied, to look back, or to pause. On our strength and growth depends the strength of others, the spread of free world trade and unity, and continued confidence in our leadership and our currency. The underdeveloped countries are dependent upon us for the sale of their primary commodities and for aid to their struggling economies. In short, a prosperous and growing America is important not only to Americans, it is as the spokesman for 20 Western nations and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, as he stressed this week, of vital importance to the entire Western world. This economy is capable of producing without strain 30 to 40 billion more than we are producing today. Business earnings could be seven to eight billion higher than they are today. Utilization of existing plant and equipment could be much higher, and if it were, investment would rise. We need not accept an unemployment rate of 5% or more. There is no need for us to be satisfied with a rate of growth that keeps good men out of work and good capacity out of use. Our choice, therefore, boils down to one of doing nothing and thereby risking a widening gap between our actual and potential growth in output, profits, and employment, or taking action at the federal level to raise our entire economy to a new and higher level of business activity. If we do not take action, those who have the most reason to be dissatisfied with our present rate of growth will be tempted to seek short-sighted and narrow solutions to resist automation to reduce the work week to 35 hours or even lower, to shut out imports, or to raise prices in a vain effort to obtain full capacity profits on under capacity operations. But these are all self-defeating expedients, which can only restrict the economy, not expand it. There are a number of ways by which the federal government can meet its responsibilities to aid economic growth we can and must step up the development of our natural resources. But the most direct and significant kind of federal action, aiding economic growth, is to make possible an increase in private consumption and investment demand, to cut the fetters which hold back private spending. 
In the past, this could be done in part by the increased use of credit and monetary tools. But our balance of payments situation today places limits on our use of those tools for expansion. It could also be done by increasing federal expenditures more rapidly than necessary. But such a course would soon demoralize both the government and our economy. If government is to retain the confidence of the people, it must not spend more than can be justified on grounds of national need or spent with maximum efficiency. The final and best means of strengthening demand among consumers and business is to reduce the burden on private income and the deterrence to private initiative which are imposed by our present tax system. And this administration pledged itself last summer to an across-the-board, top-to-bottom cut in personal and corporate income taxes to be enacted and become effective in 1963. I am not talking about a quickie or a temporary tax cut, which would be more appropriate if a recession were imminent. Nor am I talking about giving the economy a mere shot in the arm to ease some temporary complaint. I am talking about the accumulated evidence of the last five years that our present tax system, developed as it was in good part during World War II to restrain growth, exerts too heavy a drag on growth in peacetime, that it siphons out of the private economy too large a share of personal and business purchasing power, that it reduces the financial incentives for personal effort, investment, and risk-taking. In short, to increase demand and lift the economy, the federal government's most useful role is not to rush into a program of excessive increases in public expenditures, but to expand the incentives and opportunities for private expenditures. 